When we think of certain figures, at least back in the day, we think of trustworthy, good person, or safe. Nowadays, we know better. We know that just because someone holds a certain position, it doesn't necessarily mean they're worthy of that position or possess the qualities that are associated with that position. More often than not, people with certain tendencies like narcissism, wanting power, deceivers, etc., they somehow work their way into these beloved positions because they want what comes with that. Enter Hans Schmidt, born in 1881 in the Bavarian town of Offenburg to a Protestant father and a Catholic mother. There isn't much on his familial life other than that his father would not only beat his mother, but would beat him, and that started at a young age. It's also reported that mental illness had a long history on both sides of his family. According to relatives, Hans beheaded two of his parents' as geese and kept the heads in his pocket. He also went to the slaughterhouse daily, where he would watch the animals be put to death and dissected. Now, no one will probably be able to verify that, like, and say that's 100% true, especially since, you know, how people always make up stories about who someone is or things they've done after they've been convicted of a crime, so we just will never know how true that statement is. Schmidt, throughout his life, was fascinated with death and religion so he decided to pursue priesthood as an adult, much to the dismay of those around him. They questioned his morality and mental fitness. However, Schmidt claimed that he was ordained by Bishop Kirsten of Mons on December 23, 1904. In a later conversation with Manhattan aliens, he recalled, the bishop ordained me alone. I do not like to speak of it. The real ordination took place the night before. St. Elizabeth, she ordained me herself. I was praying at my bedside when she appeared to me and said, I ordain you to the priesthood. There was light during her appearance. I told no one. I thought it best to keep to myself. They would make fun of me. They always made fun of me for these things. They always expect others to do as they do. God speaks to people in different ways. During his parish assignments in the villages of Burgle and Sillingstock, Hans molested altar boys, had affairs with several women, and held the company of prostitutes. He was eventually arrested in 1905 for foraging diplomas for failing students. The prosecutor was looking to send Schmidt to prison, but his father hired a lawyer who got the charges dropped for mental defect. Also, his unique way of saying mass and unconventional sermons led to complaints to the Monsignor and Bishop. He was then given no more parish assignments. Once he was basically blackballed, he decided to relocate to the U.S. He did a short stint at St. John's Roman Catholic Church in Louisville, Kentucky. He had problems with his superior, which resulted in his transfer to Boniface's church in New York City. With all of these complaints, arrests, and rifts, kind of makes you wonder why they didn't just relieve him of his duties. But as we know, it's always move and pretend it never happened, leaving traumatized people while abusers never face the consequences. While serving in NYC, he met Anna in 1912. She was the housekeeper at the rectory of Boniface Church and had immigrated to the U.S. in 1910. Schmidt immediately was taken with her. Schmidt claimed to have heard a voice from God ordering him to love Anna. He started making advances, which Anna refused at first. She eventually gave in and they started a secret affair. Now, dude was all over the place. Not only was he engaging in relations with Anna, he also started an affair with New York City dentist Ernest Moret. And not only were they bumping big ones, they also ran a counterfeiting ring together. Schmidt later admitted that he enjoyed being with Ernest more than being with Anna. Can we just take a moment and acknowledge this man's dedication? Like, he didn't waste a single moment of his 24 hours. He was having two affairs, running a counterfeiting ring, not being safe around children, and on top of all of that, still performing his priestly duties. He must have known he was going to hell sooner rather than later. All right, I, let me stop. <laughs> but let's get back to Anna. Hans was transferred to Hardin St. Joseph's Church, but stayed in touch with Anna, continuing their affair. They even got married in a secret ceremony, which Hans officiated. Now, for those of you who don't know, Catholic priests aren't supposed to get married because they take a vow of celibacy. And while there are states that allow you to officiate your own wedding without a third party, New York isn't one of those states. Even then, it's not a recognized union everywhere. I'm not sure about the Catholic rules about self-officiating, but it's like most likely not allowed. So they were happily married until one time during a sexual encounter on the high altar of St. Joseph's Church. And you don't have to rewind that because yes, I did say the high altar at the church. Schmidt received what he interpreted as a command from God to sacrifice Anna. 
Hans, being the gentleman that he was, told Anna about this command, who in turn called him crazy. Not long after, Anna told Hans that she was pregnant. Now, me personally, I would have ghosted that man the minute he told me God wanted my head. Like, when I found out I was pregnant, I would have done, like, one of three things. I would have ran away and raised a child, had the baby and skedaddle from the hospital, or just, like, falling down the stairs. Because the way my mind would immediately thought he passed down his desire to take me out through DNA, I, you know, I just don't need that in my life. Anyway, the night of September 12, 1913, Schmidt went to the apartment they rented as a married couple and slashed a sleeping Anna's throat, drank her blood, raped her as she bled to death, dismembered her body, and threw the pieces from a ferry into the Hudson River. He then went to St. Joseph's, had mass, and administered the Holy Communion. Pieces of Anna's body turned up along the shore at Cliffside Park in Weehawken, New Jersey. The Hudson County detectives found a price tag attached to the pillowcase used to wrap part of her body. The pillowcase was then traced to a factory in Newark. Now this particular factory only sold to Manhattan furniture dealer, George Sachs. Once that connection was made, NYPD took over and assigned the investigation to Joseph Faro, the Manhattan chief of detectives. Joseph went to Sachs' store, but he wasn't able to tell him how many of those pillowcases he sold. JF then checked the receipts and found that a mattress, bed spring, pillows, and pillowcases had been sold to A. Van Dyke on August 26, 1913. Schmidt, who thought he was clever in changing his name, actually messed up because he put his actual address for the delivery. JF went to the complex on 68 Broadhurst Avenue and began questioning the superintendent. He found out that the apartment in question belonged to a married couple listed under the husband's name, H. Schmidt, who was described as a man with a heavy German accent. After getting the info, JF arranged a stakeout. After three days, when no one arrived, J.F. ordered the detective on scene, Frank C., to break into the apartment. A search found that the floor had recently been scrubbed, but the large amounts of blood remained on the walls. There was also a large knife stained with blood found in the kitchen. There were clothes with the name A. Van Dyke sewn into the clothing, and numerous letters in both German and English found addressed to Schmidt. A large portion of those letters were from women in Germany, but most were from Anna. They traced her most recent address from one of the letters where they were told she recently moved after getting a job at St. Boniface's Church as a housekeeper. Joseph and the detectives then visited the church and was told by John Brown that Anna had been a housekeeper but transferred to St. Joseph's. After being asked about Hans, he told them he was a former priest there but had also transferred to St. Joseph's. Once they arrived to St. Joseph's, Daniel Quinn led them to where Schmidt was sleeping. After being confronted, Hans said, I killed her. I killed her because I loved her. He then went on to describe the murder and dismemberment in detail. Once the story got out, it became a media spectacle. His priestly faculties were finally suspended indefinitely. During trial number one, they went for the death penalty. He pled not guilty by reason of insanity. His defense used his bisexuality and claims of hearing voices as proof of their client's psychosis. They also used his family's long history of mental illness and called in psychologist Smith E.J., who testified that his family tree had up to 60 distant relatives that displayed signs of mental illness, and so he should not get the death penalty because he's also insane. And multiple alienists who questioned Schmidt before the trial to argue that, despite the claims of hearing voices, Hans was in fact sane and should get the death penalty. The prosecutor's efforts fell on deaf ears as there was a hung jury in December 1913. Now, how there was a hung jury is beyond me. The fact that Americans always let known murderers and rapists off needs to be studied. Like, it's just so completely wild to me. Like, how do you have more sympathy for the person that committed the act than the person that the act was actually done to, the one that was actually hurt? It's just so insane. There was a second trial held about two weeks later. This time, the prosecution came with the big guns. A woman named Bertha, a German immigrant, came forward and informed the jury of how Schmidt convinced her to pose as Anna and get a $5,000 life insurance policy in her name in April of 1913. This was well before her death. The policy listed Schmidt as the sole beneficiary. On February 5, 1914, 
The jury found Hans guilty of murder in the first degree after three hours of deliberation. Shortly after being sentenced to death, he stated, I'm satisfied with the verdict. I would rather die today than tomorrow. He was then sent to Sing Sing Prison to await his death. On February 18, 1916, Schmidt entered the Sing Sing death chamber at 5.50 a.m. Before being seated into the electric chair, he said, I want to say one word before I go. I beg forgiveness of all I have offended or scandalized, and I forgive all who have offended against me. After being seated, his last words were, My last word is to say goodbye to my dear old mother. The first jolt of electricity was initiated at 5.50 a.m. He was pronounced dead by the prison physician after two more additional jolts, making him the only priest to be executed in the U.S. He was described as being cool by the guards. A reporter wrote, His last night on earth he spent proclaiming his innocence and declaring that he had made peace with God. His family wanted his body sent back, but with World War I complications, it was impossible. His body was buried in a secret location per the family's request. This is just a sad case of growing up in an abusive household, people in power not being held accountable for their actions, and parents not letting their children accept the consequences of those actions. I can only imagine the amount of traumatized people who would have been okay had that initial prosecutor been able to make him pay for his crime. Anna might have had a long life. We never know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Also, let me know about any other true crime story you want me to cover. Like and subscribe as well. Thanks for watching. See you next video.